so good to see all of you here. Uh, I want to welcome you all and those of you that are watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and here at Venia, we share the grace of God by loving people because God accepts us as we are, and He sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's Word changes our lives, and so today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. And I want to talk to you today about how Jesus is the subject of a parable. A parable is an earthly story uh, that, that's told, so it, it's telling something that's kind of a common everyday thing. Uh, if you were today to talk about you know, going to the soccer field and hanging out at the soccer field, most families understand that. Or like we said, we're going to the baseball game. These are common things in society everybody understands. So oftentimes Jesus taught in parables, he would teach a very earthly thing, something that everybody was accustomed to, everybody was familiar with. The only thing is, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily an earthly story. It was, it was trying to bring about a very spiritual meaning, a very heavenly meaning. So Jesus taught like that all the time. One of the uh, times he talked about the uh, parable of the sower. And so, you know, farming was pretty common back then. Nowadays, you know, people go to the grocery store and buy their food. But then it wasn't like that. You know, they had markets and stuff. But most people were involved in farming in some way. And if they weren't involved in it, it at least took place all around them. And so a sower, a person who's putting seed out there to grow, uh, that would be something that people saw on a regular basis. And so Jesus was saying that there's a man who went out to sow in the field. So he's taking, he's taking the seed and he's just scattering it. And everybody can get a picture of what's going on there. The seed kind of gets scattered around and some of it gets snatched up by the birds and others gets, lands on you know, a place where people are walking and so it just gets smashed on the ground. Others grow on you know, really fertile soil and grow healthy. Others uh, would grow on the, you know, in the weeds and stuff like that. And so this is an earthly story, but what Jesus was trying to bring out was a very heavenly meaning. And so we see that the Word of God is the seed, and that's what gets spread out to the world, and how it's received can, be, you know, can depend on where it falls. And that soil is our hearts. How do we receive the Word of God? So you could see he's taking this earthly story and bringing about a heavenly meaning. He, he taught like that all the time. He taught about the parable of the lost sheep. And how a shepherd, if he's got a hundred sheep and one of them goes missing, he's going to leave the 99. He's going to go and find the one that was missing. And when he does find it, he's going to carry it back. He's going to be so excited he found it. He'll go and get his friends. And together, he and his friends are going to rejoice that they found the one that was lost. Very earthly thing. People understood that. And yet, heavenly, he was talking about us as people, as we go astray, and he is our good shepherd, and he seeks to find the people that are lost. And when he finds them, he celebrates, he and his friends. In other words, he and the angels are throwing a party and rejoicing when one person that was lost is found. So again, earthly story, heavenly meaning. What we're going to find this morning is that Jesus is the subject of of a parable. In the Old Testament, there was literally a parable, an earthly story being played out. And the Israelites were part of this story. They were, they were living out something that was very earthly, very easily understandable, and yet this thing entirely was pointing to Jesus. And so let's find out what this parable is in this morning's message entitled, Why Jesus is the Parable of the Tabernacle, as we continue our study through the book of Hebrews. Remember, the book of Hebrews is written to first century Jewish believers. Uh, so these are men and women who were raised up in Judaism. They have now given their faith to Jesus. And uh, as they've given their faith to Jesus, persecutions are starting to settle in. Uh, they're starting to get discouraged about their Christianity. And so their mind's tendency is to go back. Uh, go back to Judaism, go back to what they already know. Uh, and we do that as believers too. As we give our life to Christ, there's, there's these moments in our lives where we think, well, gosh, you know, if I, if I was still like that, you know, I could accomplish so much more, but I have, I, I'm trying to move forward being a Christian, and now there's, you know, people are coming against me. And so these people were discouraged. And, and the author is trying to get them to be encouraged and through this, we're talking about Jesus and asking the question, why? 
Why Jesus? There's so many different religious figures out there. There's so many different religious systems. Why Jesus? Why is it that we follow after him? Why is he the most important religious figure to ever walk the earth? Why do we put our faith in him? Why Jesus? Uh, Last week, we talked about Jesus and answering the question, why Jesus is relevant. And in all matters of life and death and life after death, Jesus is the most relevant solution to everything that we face. And so if you missed that, go to venia.tv forward slash sermons and you can check that out. But part of the reason for Jesus being the most relevant was that Jesus rules from a superior tabernacle. And we talked about that last week. Uh, Today, what we want to do is talk a little bit more about the earthly tabernacle and uh, how that tabernacle was a parable and how that parable points us to the new covenant and to Jesus Christ. Now, in speaking of this tabernacle, verse 9 of our text this morning, verse 9 of chapter 9, it says that the tabernacle was symbolic for the present time. Maybe your version of the Bible says that it was an illustration, or it may say it was a figure. What this is, is from the Greek word parabole, which is where we get our English word parable. And so how was this earthly tabernacle a parable? How was this structure and everything that was inside of it and all the rituals surrounding it, how did these things give us a very heavenly meaning? This is what we're going to find out in our message. Now, uh, before we get into it, I'm going to throw a a picture up here. Uh, What I want to do this morning with all of us is I want to just take a a walk, basically. Uh, This is a a very crude diagram of the tabernacle proper. Uh, All the area around it, what you would find on the property there. And what I want to do is basically come in through the gate here of the tabernacle. We're going to walk through the tabernacle proper and talk about the different items. And basically what's happening is as we walk through here, we find ourselves in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, where the very presence of God was there inside the tabernacle. So we're going to walk through, and as we walk through, basically what we're doing is getting closer and closer to the very presence of God. So let's take a look at verse 1 of chapter 9, and there it says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. Let's pause there for just a moment. We're going to take a look at all these things as we, as we make this journey inward towards the presence of God, and we're going to talk about how it's an earthly thing, and yet it still has that heavenly meaning. It's still pointing us to Jesus. And so the tabernacle. Tabernacle is an earthly thing. All it is is a movable dwelling place. It's a tent. And so it, tabernacle wasn't just for God. People used tabernacles. They moved these dwelling places from place to to place. So here's an earthly thing, and yet it has a heavenly meaning. John chapter 1 verse 14 says that the Word became human and made His home among us. Who are we talking about here? Jesus. Who are we talking about here? Who who are we talking about here? Oh, there we go. Okay, we're talking about Jesus here. Jesus is the Word that became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, just like Robert was talking about during worship. He is God's Son, and He made His home among us. That that term that, that Jesus made His home among us is tabernacle. You could literally say, God tabernacled amongst us. Jesus made his home here on earth and dwelt among us. And so as we see this tabernacle where the presence of God is in this earthly thing, it's pointing us to the idea that in Jesus we're going to see the ultimate fulfillment of God dwelling among us. Now, if we can put the the, uh, picture back up, what happens as you step onto this property, you're going to come, like I said, you're going to come into view of certain things. The first thing that you show up at is the brazen altar of burnt offerings. And so sin needed to be made atone for. There at the brazen altar of burnt offerings, they would sacrifice a lamb. This lamb had to be unblemished. It had to be a perfect lamb, a perfect sacrifice. So there, and this wasn't specific just to 
Judaism. It wasn't specific just to, to God's true people, because anywhere where God institutes something, the enemy's always there to try to replicate it and copy it and make his own version of it. So animal sacrifice went beyond Judaism, and other people were doing it. So no matter who showed up to take a look at this, it, it was pretty common to everyone that somebody would make a sacrifice of an animal to their God. So that's the first thing that you would see is this place where an unblemished lamb was to be sacrificed. Now, the purpose of the sacrifice was to cover sin. Notice I say cover, not remove. It was was symbolically covering, we're going to talk when we get to the mercy seat, but it was symbolically covering the sin of the people. Very earthly thing, but it had a very heavenly meaning. John chapter 1 verse 29 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Doesn't cover the sin of the world, but does what? Takes it away, literally removes it. And so what you see in the tabernacle at that That altar of burnt offerings, that is symbolic, it just symbolically covers, and yet the fulfillment, this heavenly meaning is Jesus, where Jesus literally removes the sin, He takes it away. Let's move forward from there. So first thing you see is that that altar of burnt offerings. The next thing you would come into contact with is the brazen altar, I'm sorry, the brazen laver. A laver is simply a wash basin. So there the priests would show up to wash their hands and wash their feet. Why? Because they just killed animals, right? And what happens when you kill an animal? It's bloody. It's dirty. It's messy. So they got their hands dirty. They've got blood on their hands, literally. And so here they, they go from this place where they would sacrifice the animal to the next place where they would wash their hands, wash their feet. Again, this is earthly. Anybody who's ever worked in a butcher shop understands this. After you've done that, you need to get washed up. So they would go from the, the altar now to the labor. They'd wash their hands. They'd wash their feet. Again, earthly, and yet it has a very heavenly meaning. It's pointing us to Jesus. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. We've all heard this story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And yet a lot of people don't know what's actually going on there or why he did that. You you may notice when you read that story that Peter said, don't wash just my feet, Lord, wash my whole body. I want to be clean in your presence. I want to be made right. Don't don't just do my feet. Do the whole deal. And Jesus is like, no, no, hold on a second. You've already been clean. And so what this is referring to there is being born again in Christ and having the forgiveness of your sins. When Jesus forgives you of your sins, He's forgiving the past, the present, and the future. He's wiping it all clean. You are clean. And then what happens? You get baptized. You, you come into a saving knowledge of Christ, and then you get baptized doing what? Symbolically identifying with Jesus Christ. Identifying with His death, His burial, the resurrection. So when we go in the waters of baptism, we put you underneath the water, symbol of death and burial, we bring you back up, a symbol of resurrection into new life. We're, we're identifying with Jesus Christ. So the point that Jesus was making in washing the feet is, listen, you've already got your whole body clean. Now what's going to happen is you've got your day-to-day stuff. You're going to get dirt on your feet. You're going you're gonna to make mistakes, and what you got to do is just come to me and clean off your feet. Get, get, get right with God. He's talking about daily coming to the Lord, confessing your sin daily, and just saying, Lord, I, I messed up. Uh, make me clean. Clear my conscience. Give me a new day. Let me start over. And so this is what it's talking about. So symbolically here where, yeah, they're, they've already gone through their ceremonial bathing. Now they're just washing their hands and their feet. Speaks of the future and what Jesus was talking about. And the idea is you can't just barge into the presence of God without dealing with your sin. You know, they're about to enter into the holy of holies. They need to be made right. They need to be clean. So continuing on verse 2, we see the first part, which was the lampstand. So this is the second part of uh, verse 2. It says, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, 
and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So now we're actually inside the tabernacle. We've walked onto the tabernacle proper. We've passed this altar. We've passed the brazen labor. We've gone through the entrance, or the first veil, if you will. We've gone in through that entrance. We're inside the tabernacle now. We're not inside the Holy of Holies. We're not in the very presence of God yet, but we're right outside of it. And there's a few things that we find. As you walk in and you turn to the left, the first thing you see is a golden lampstand. This gold, it's a seven-branch lampstand. And the idea there is when you would walk in, there were several layers of animal skins. This, uh, the, the uh, tent material all the way around it was very, very thick. It was super, super thick. There was no light getting in there. And so once you were to walk inside and find yourself in this tabernacle, pitch black, walking around in utter darkness. So the need for a lampstand. This lampstand would be in there to give light to the room so you could see and be guided in your, your um, task that you had to carry out once you were inside. So that's an earthly thing. Everybody then and even now understands the need. You're in a dark room. You need to give light to the room. Heavenly, though, this is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus told us something. He says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I don't have to convince you guys. We live in a dark world. Even people who haven't given themselves over to Jesus, they understand this. They understand that we're walking around in darkness. How, how do we know this? Because they're searching for light. They talk about enlightenment. Oh, I just want to be enlightened. Oh, I want to be. But the problem is they're searching out darkness to try to enlighten their life. They're, they're searching out darkness as their source of enlightenment. And Jesus says, look, you're searching out darkness. I'm the one with the light. I am the light. If you'll just seek me out, you won't have to walk around in darkness anymore. And so this dark room with this light, giving light to this dark room and lighting the path and showing the way and, and helping to reveal what was there. This was a foreshadow of Jesus. And now as we see Jesus, he says, I am that light. I'm exactly what you need to not have to walk around in darkness anymore. Right there in that same room, on one side you've got an earthly thing, a lampstand. On the other side, you have a table. This table was a table of showbread. So on one side of the room, as you walk in, on the left is that golden menorah or the lampstand. On your right would be a table. On the table would be 12 loaves of bread. These 12 loaves of bread would represent the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 tribes of Jacob, same thing. Um, those 12 loaves reminded them of God's provision, reminded them of God's daily uh, provision for meeting the needs of the people. Again, this is an earthly thing, it was an earthly reminder, but it was pointing ahead to something heavenly for us to understand. John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. And Jesus replied, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So here you've got this bread inside this room representing what you need. The idea that God provides for you. The idea that God is going to take care of you. And then Jesus himself says, I am that bread. I'm exactly what you need. And we look around the room and I, I think we're all in the same boat. We have concerns in life. How are we going to get through life? How are we going to pay the next bill? How am I going to make sure food's on the table? How, how, how are we going to get this church building all finished out so that way we can move into our own place? How, how, how? And Jesus says, look, I'm the bread. I've got everything you need. I'm going to, I provided for the 12 tribes of Israel. I provided for them while they're wandering. I keep providing for them, and I'm going to provide for you. I've got all you need. And so this earthly thing was pointing ahead to Jesus. Now, we're going to keep moving forward. 
We've seen the lampstand on one side, the showbread on the other side. You keep moving forward. The next thing you come to is a golden altar of incense. There at this golden altar of incense, the priest would show up with incense. He would burn those incense, and the incense, the smell of that would fill the entire room. And as he did this, the high priest, he would make, he would make prayers. He would make uh, pleadings to God on behalf of the people. And so remember, the job of a priest is to re- represent the people to God. Remember, the prophets represent God to the people. The priests represent people to God. And so the high priest would go in representing the people to God, and he would plead on their behalf. And symbolically, you know, the, the incense would fill that room, right? It would fill it. It would smell good. Same deal. I mean, God talks about our prayers. The prayers of a righteous person, it goes up to heaven like incense go up, and it fills the throne of God, so that way it's a sweet-smelling aroma to God. Very same thing here. Uh, The idea, though, and then we see it pointing ahead to Jesus, is Romans chapter 8. There in Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, it says, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and raised us uh, raised, um, raised to life for us. He was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us doing what the high priest would do for us, and yet he's not doing it from some earthly place. Now Jesus is seated at the very right hand. He's, stand, he's right there with God, and he's saying, look, let me represent the people to you. I'm going to plead on their behalf to you. And so everything we saw there was pointing us to the ultimate fulfillment, which was Jesus. It's pointing us to the Lord. Now let's move forward a little bit more. As we move forward, the next thing we come to is the second veil. So remember, there's the the veil. The first veil is that entrance into the tabernacle. But then there's a second veil that we come to, and that is separating the front of the tabernacle to the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. And verse 3 tells us that behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or the Holy of Holies, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. Let's pause there for a moment. Let's talk about this veil. This veil, or curtain, or drape, however you want to refer to it, this veil was a symbolic separation. I mean, it was physical, but it was was symbolic in the fact that on one side was a very holy God. On one side was the absence of sin. On one side was perfection. On one side was the very presence of God Himself. On the other side was a human being, a person who sinned, a person who had to make atonement for himself and for his family and for a nation. And so on one side is perfection, on the other side is sinful man. And there's this barrier in between, this veil that says, listen, you can't go in there. You have to stay outside because you are not right to be in the presence of God. You are not without sin to be in the presence of God. And only one day a year was a man allowed to go in there. It was the day of Yom Kippur. And so other than that, they'd go inside the tabernacle, but they'd have to stay outside of the presence of God because of their sin. Very earthly thing pointing us to something very real about Jesus, though, because when we take a look at Jesus and his death on the cross. As he died, something magnificent happened. The earth began to shake, and as the earth began to shake, we see that the veil, this part that separated mankind from the holy presence of God, was torn down the middle, from the top to the bottom. So in other words, it wasn't a human being that came in there and started pulling this thing apart. It it was God starting from the top to the bottom, tearing it open, symbolically showing us no longer is there this separation. What is it that separates us from the presence of God? It's sin. And so what he's saying is, I've dealt with sin. That separation is no longer there. You can now enter freely into the presence of God and spend time with God, have a relationship with God, commune with God because of what Jesus had done. And so here is this earthly thing pointing us to its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And there, once you're in this room, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Continuing in verse 4, it says about the Ark of the Covenant uh, that it was overlaid 
on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And so earthly things, right? You have an ark. An ark is just this wooden box. It's a wooden box overlaid with gold. It's just a box, right? I mean, this is an earthly thing. And so there in this earthly box were earthly things. There were tablets of stone. Tablets of stone had what on them? The Ten Commandments, right? Then there was a pot of manna. And then there was this rod or a staff. It's just a piece of wood that budded. And on top was the mercy seat. And so here's this earthly thing. And yet within it and what it's pointing to is so heavenly. Inside those, there was the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And what this is, is it's showing us that there are the rules that God has set forward, and neither you nor I can ever live up to it. We try our best, we, and that's, what, that's all God's asking, right? That we, we wake up every morning and we try, but as hard as we try, we're still going to mess up. And so that's showing us that ultimately we have the forgiveness of breaking God's law in Jesus. Then there's that jar of manna or the pot of manna showing us that no matter what we need in life, Jesus has what we need. And then also there's the budding, the budding um, uh, rod of Aaron, this, this wood that would bud on it. It was the dead piece of wood, but it would bud. And symbolically what this is showing us is that God can bring life from death. And we see that, a picture of that in Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead. And then on top, you've got this mercy seat. And this mercy seat, later on in chapter, or in chapter 9, verse 22, uh, what we'll find is that it reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so everything within this is pointing us to Jesus. It's pointing us to our need for Jesus. It's pointing us to our provision in Jesus, everything in there. And then verse 5, It says, above the Ark of the Covenant were the cherubim. Cherubim are a type of angels. It says that there they were, these cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak. So these were just earthly things. They weren't real angels. These were just symbolic of angels. They were figures of angels made out of gold. There, one on one side, one on the other. These figures, earthly things, right? And yet they point us to Jesus. And notice it says, we can't even speak about this in detail. Why? There's so much to say about this. There's so many implications about the angels and Jesus that that are important. And he says, we we don't even have time to talk about it. And we really don't this morning, but I just want to give you a few things so we can understand why this is in here. When Jesus was born here on earth, who was there? Angels. When Jesus was tempted, who was there? angels. When Jesus was going through his agonies, who was, who was there? Angels. When Jesus was, in his, in, when he was being resurrected, who was there? Angels, right? When Jesus was ascending into heaven, who was there? Angels. When Jesus is coming back, angels. You know, there, there's so much in this, and the, you know, he says, look, we don't even have time to get into it, but there's so much about that that's pointing us to Jesus. So much in there that, that says, listen, this, all this is about is about Jesus. Now, let's continue and take a look. I mean, it, it's amazing how much this is pointing us to our Lord. Take a look at verse 6. It says, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. Remember, into the, not into the Holy of Holies, but just into that first part. So it says they'd always go into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services, but, verse 7, into the second part, in other words, into the Holy of Holies, into the second part, the high priest went only once, he went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. What is this talking about? Yom Kippur. It's talking about that day of atonement. One day a year where the high priest would make a sacrifice of a bull. And that sacrifice of that bull was for, to atone for his own sin and for the sin of his family. And then he would sacrifice that goat. There's two goats. One would be sacrificed and then the other one be, would be released out into the wilderness. And that was the scapegoat. Symbolically, the sin was let out of the camp. So on that day, he would go into the Holy of Holies 
The atonement was made, covering, symbolically covering the sin. And so he would go in, uh, but only once a year. Now, this all, I mean, they would live this out. This was a part of their culture. This was a part of their day-to-day life. But it was a parable. It was an earthly thing pointing us to Jesus. And so what's the point of all of this? Well, I would ask you, what's the point of any parable? Well, why did Jesus teach in parables? He wants us to understand. He wants us to get it because the the thing is, these spiritual things, these things about heaven, it's outside of our understanding. It's outside of our dimension. And so what God is trying to do is bring things down to our level, bring things down to to a field where we can understand because we understand farming. We understand sheep. Right? We understand an altar and burning intercess, you know, incense and intercessing to God. We, we can understand these things. And so these things are all pointing us to a heavenly meaning. And so it helps us to better understand it. And one of the things you'll notice when Jesus would teach in these parables, he would teach the parable, he would say the parable. He'd tell the story of, of the shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one got lost and so he left the 99 and he went to find one. So he would tell these earthly stories and then he'd just kind of walk away. And then later on the disciples would come up and they're like, so Lord, what did that mean? So what, what's the point? Why, why did you tell us this story? Because they knew that he had a purpose. He didn't waste a minute. Jesus wasn't lazy. He, he had a purpose in everything he did. He was always about the Father's business. So they'd come up to him, what did that mean? And he'd start to explain what it meant. And now we get to read through the Gospels and see all these parables, and we don't have to sit around wondering what it meant, because now we know. But that was very common. He would give the story and later on explain the meaning. Here what you have is this earthly story. This parable found that was lived out daily and yearly by the Israelites. And later on, God's Spirit gives the meaning. He comes back to say, look, you've been doing this over and over again. Now let me tell you why. Let me tell you what the point was so that way you understand. And so notice in verse 8, we're told that the Holy Spirit indicating this. So, so here's basically what's happening. Here's now the Spirit's going to explain the parable. So indicating this that the way into the holiest of all, in other words, the way into the very presence of God. So the the Holy Spirit's going to explain this now. To get into the very presence of God, that way was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Verse 9, it says, it was symbolic. Here's where we began today's message. It was a parable. Uh, it was that word, parabole, where we get our word parable. This whole thing, all these sacrifices, all the washing of your hands, all these things that you did, the light and the manna, all these things were pointing you to the place where you could find your way into the holiest of holies, where all people could find their way. It says it was symbolic for the present time, there in verse 9, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service. Who is that? The priests, right? It cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. What is this point in saying this? He says, listen... If all the washing of your hands and all the sacrifice and all the burning of incense and all of these things, if that, all those rituals couldn't even make the priest perfect in his conscience, and he's the one that's doing it, if it couldn't even work for him, how's it going to work for all of you? Right? That's what he's saying. He's saying, look, it it doesn't even work for him. And so this is all symbolic, and it's pointing you to the one that can do it for you. That's what it's doing. And so, yes, in this, God is teaching us about the tabernacle. He's teaching us about Jesus 
being here with us and living amongst us. And he's teaching us about the lamb and this sacrificial lamb that would be unblemished and sacrificed for the covering of sins. And he's teaching us about cleansing and our, our need for daily confession and light and how we need Jesus' light to be here in this dark world. And we need to shine that light out to other people and teaching us about God's provision and how we can always trust in him and about prayer and how we can go to the Lord. But ultimately, what is this showing us? Ultimately, this is showing us God's concern. It's showing us what God truly cares about. What is it He cares about? You. That's what it is. That's what God is concerned with. He's not concerned with people washing their hands. See, that's the point that He's making. It's like people are going through these things and it becomes about washing your hands. The hands have to be all clean. It has nothing to do with your hands. He's saying, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to understand that I am concerned about your eternal well-being and I have what's best in store for you today. I'm concerned with your conscience being cleared and you being able to live the way I've called you to live. But what happens when when you don't give your life over to Jesus and you don't accept that He's the one that can do this, you don't have a cleared conscience. And so what happens is all the problems of yesterday start to eat away at your body. You literally start to get so stressed out about what you've done and the consequences of those things. It eats at you so much that you literally become sick. You know what I'm talking about. I know this. The consequences of our sin is terrible and it eats us up. And what God says is, look, you don't have to worry about that. You can have a clear conscience. What happened yesterday was yesterday. I've already forgotten about it. I've cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. You don't have to worry about it. But the enemy wants you to. The enemy wants you to focus on everything you did yesterday. And guess what? If he can't get you to focus on everything you did yesterday, he wants you to focus on tomorrow. He wants you to worry about tomorrow. How how am I going to get to work? And what is it going to make enough money? And is enough work going to come in for me to be able to provide for my family? And oh my gosh, I don't even know. And what happens if I have to deal with something tomorrow that I wasn't planning on? And we get our focus on tomorrow. And guess what? Tomorrow hasn't even happened. We're crossing bridges. We haven't even shown up yet. Tomorrow isn't even promised to us. But that's the trick of the enemy. If he can get you to focus on all the stupidity you did yesterday or focus on everything that may come up tomorrow, then your focus isn't on God right now. And God says, listen, all these things that I've done, they're pointing you to what I want you focused on right now. I don't want you focused on your sin. I want your clear conscience. I want you to focus. Some of you are walking in here today and you're like, whew, You don't know how glad I am to hear that, Pastor Tim, because you wouldn't believe what I did yesterday. (laughs) I feel so good to know that I I don't have to worry about that. All I have to do is confess today, God, you know I messed up. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I broke your heart but I'm glad you've forgiven me. Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live today saying it's the day you've made. I'm going to do what? There you go. Rejoice and be glad in it. Don't worry about yesterday. Rejoice in today. You can't go back to yesterday. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Consider today. What does God want for you now? God wants your focus on Him. Satan's trying to steal that. Satan's trying to redirect it to things that don't matter anymore. That's what Satan's trying to do. Let's have our focus where God wants it. Amen? His concern is with you. Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, we are so grateful.